Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Pete Blackshaw. He is CEO of Centrifuge, which is a public-private partnership in downtown Cincinnati that has put Cincinnati on the map as an innovation growth center. He's also the former head of digital marketing and social media at Nestle. Pete, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. Delighted to be here. So where did your personal story of innovation begin? I'm not sure I've ever been able to ask you that. Well, it actually goes back to age 14 when I started my first uh, business. I was actually the youngest avocado grower in Southern California. Really? A guy knocked on our door and said, I'll give you $100 if I can strip your trees. And of course, as a 14-year-old with no money, I'm like, I have to enter that business. <laughs> and That's and that was a storytelling exercise because I really leveraged the fact that, uh, you know, the story of the young kid who uh, worked hard and kind of Pick the tree, pick the avocados from the family tree, then the neighbors' trees, and then I set up shop in one of the first certified farmers markets in Southern California. Wow! And had to build a narrative around it. Had to learn how to kind of make my story rise to the top relative to other players that were selling <laughs> avocados. So, it so wasn't. What was it wasn't just about price. Oh, I would, um, I would juggle. I would make guacamole. <laughs> we had these little very unique avocados. They were called cocktail avocados that you could literally, um, that were really kind of small. There was, it was the Forte brand. And I just kind of learned how to romance the, the narrative. In fact, the one thing that was interesting about California is that it didn't matter if you were big ag or little guy, they would do anything they could to help anyone sell produce. And so I took full advantage of their tools, you know, at p and they might call that a playbook okay. or a capability building or a fact book. But back then, it was just um, inspiration to tell a story to bring more people closer to your uh, booth. Oh, my goodness. That's wonderful. <laughs> I love that image. Well, and now I feel like the avocado is very romanced. Rom- it's romanticized. Fu- well, it's funny. <laughs> well, avo- yeah, I think I was way ahead of my time. Right. And then yeah, I had avocado the avocado toast is like a feature. It's menu unbelievable. Item now. Yeah. No. Yeah. And then I kind of carried that entrepreneurial bug to. University of California, Santa Cruz. And it was a bit of a counterculture school and very rebellious. In fact, I think a lot of reasons why I'm very good at uh, at digital leadership is kind of, I've kind of kept that rebellious spirit. And our, our mascot was the banana slug, the iconoclastic banana slug. And it was an informal mascot, but we decided to try to make it official. And of course, the administration thought that would be the worst thing for the school. So I, I co-created a logo that tried to soften the edge around the banana slug. So I had the, the, the slug was wearing glasses, <laughs> reading Play-Doh, and we put it in the middle of the university logo, which stood for Fiat Lux, Let There Be Light. We said Fiat Slug. And, but, but, and we Let romanced the slug. story. And we kind of said, hey, listen, yes, it's kind of the anti-mascot mascot, but this is a mascot that is glorifying um, – academics and studying and the pursuit of truth and the company of friends. And it kind of went viral. And what was initially just a propaganda t-shirt mm-hmm. became a big business, uh, not a big business, but it, you know, we created a On t-shirt. Campus, though. <laughs> we created a t-shirt company called Oxford West Collegiate Designs and Images. And then what happened is Quentin Tarantino discovered the t-shirt and actually used it in Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Um, and it, it actually isn't about a third of Pulp Fiction. It's a T-shirt that John Travolta wears. And that kind of took the story to a whole nother level. And I was in business school worried I was going to flunk out. And I had all these media reporters calling me up saying, uh, trying to interview me. And I just said, I threw my hands up. And it was right when the Mosaic browser had come out. And we ended up creating a website called SlugWeb um, to kind of put all the literature about the slug out there so I wouldn't get... Um, harassed by reporters. I should have called it Amazon. <laughs> but <Looking back. laughs> uh, but yeah, but it was really, um, you know, we end, in the business, I think, tripled. And then I ended up selling the logo back to the university as a good alumni. But, um, but it was a good narrative that still is kind of held. And even when you go back there, that early identity was really important. And it wasn't just about telling the story. It was about being really disciplined around what the brand essence was. Everybody was creating logos. I was trying to really impress upon the world that this was 
a um, you know there was a there was a narrative here. There's a movement behind this identity, and that's really important. And those skills have helped my storytelling ever since. Uh, then I went and worked for a politician in one of the fa- kind of a, a rising star Latino um, uh, state senator, um, and worked in the California legislature as his press secretary. And that was all about storytelling oh, at sure. that time. You know, we were our ambition was, you know, he was trying to become the first Latino governor of uh, California. And, you know, we're trying to figure out how do you tell stories that really cross over to the skeptical white voters? How do you build multiracial, you know, coalitions? Um, You know, how do you tell the Latino story in a way that, uh, you know, uh, felt more inclusive to others? And and that was a really fantastic experience. And he was uh, a very, very gifted storyteller. And and um and it, you know and that was a, a great experience and but he ultimately told me to go to business school <laughs> <laughs> which is why I landed here in Cincinnati that's right that's right incredible i it's it's interesting politicians i think are the, the ones who rise to the top anyway tend to be really strong storytellers or at least have a relatability through their stories that helps pull people in oh the the, the gentleman i work for his name was art torres he's still a dear friend and he was just a gifted orator but he was always really good at combining the details of the policy with, um, you know, kind of foundations and literature or kind of going back to, you know, sometimes we'd have a 2 a.m. Senate floor debate and he'd scream at me, say, bring me my Shakespeare book. And he'd always find some <laughs> historical reference point or some inspirational quote that kind of got the extra votes. And so, yeah, it's all about framing the context. It's all the art of persuasion, right? I mean, it yeah, all goes, yeah. you know, you're, a student, you're yeah. a student of rhetoric. My favorite book was the, uh, what, Theory of Rhetoric from Aristotle, yes, who talked about yes. pathos and ethos. Yes, and, and logos, we, yes. Yeah, we use all these different terms in the world of social media and conversational marketing, but it all kind of gets back to those same principles, yeah. the authority of your voice, you know, the empathy of understanding your audience and get that right and you can work in any medium. I completely agree. That's I, I wow, a few minutes into this episode and we're talking about Aristotle. <laughs> I really mean it. That was my favorite book and I still I still in fact when I did digital training at Nestle, I would always have everybody read excerpts of that. Because there's just really? so much hype around digital and social media. Sort of like, it's get like, back to the reason, the basic human reason why this works and why this matters. Back to the basics to reach yes. the future. Yes. Tell me about your time at Nestle. Well, I promise we'll get to Cincinnati and yeah, all the sure. great work that we're doing now here. Um, but tell me about running a global social media presence. It was a fantastic opportunity. Um, it's still hard to look at Instagram photos from my friend. A friends, you know, uh, of the beautiful Lake Geneva, um, you know, where Nestle is based. But great, great experience. But, you know, interesting from a storytelling perspective, you know, I got to Nestle because a story went really, really bad. Really? And what I mean by that is, you know, so their loss was my opportunity. So Greenpeace, you know, had raised some really big issues related to supply chain and they basically co-opted the website. Uh, they dressed up in orangutan suits and kind of came down from the rafters at Nestle's AGM. But to some extent, they kind of told the story better than Nestle did. And then when Nestle tried to respond in social media, they did what most big companies do. They invoked legal and they kind of were quite condescending with the consumer and it completely backlashed. The opportunity for me is that there was this epiphany, I think, for the executives there who said, we we need to take this seriously. We need an outside perspective. We need to bump up the role from typical manager to vice president. And moreover, we need to blend the role between marketing and corpcom, which is really important because I do think that too many um, business leaders are sitting in silos. You almost have to straddle the the public policy and uh, you know the marketing side together, and so especially due to new social media technologies. Oh, like, right, th- that wasn't as critical maybe ten or fifteen years ago. Big but time. Now it's, uh, it's it's social media presence. It's marketing, but it's also public relations and communications. It's sort of packaged into one. So really, you are one of the you were in a position that was elevating social media. So I jumped into time. a bad story. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, and the thing about the internet, the internet never forgets. Even to this day, I mean, you can type in a brand and Google never forgets. Wikipedia never forgets. So, and it was difficult because at Nestle, you know, 40% of 
the Wikipedia entry is a story of controversial practices from the past. So you've got this digital vehicle, the number one most popular website, um, or at least the one that indexes the most in Google is kind of telling this counter story. And so the challenge for the storyteller is how do you begin to not dance around that, but begin to create some credible counterweights yes, and it has yes. to be credible yes, and, yes. and sustainability is really difficult. I'm yeah. going to give a speech at PNG on this topic um, in about an hour. And I've been thinking a lot about it and, you know, you just can't greenwash. You can't just, you know, make a loose claim and it has to be credible. And I do think over time, Nestle's leadership, which I, you know, got very, very close to and deeply admire, um, started to build some real f- credible foundations on policies around water, um, you know, limiting waste, um, supply chain practice. It's not like they got out of palm oil, but I do think they and other companies, um, Unilever PNG included, kind of rallied around some self-regulatory areas that kind of opened up the door for more um, aggressive storytelling in the in this in this area, um, but but the but yes, because there was the, there was a depth to actual change behind it. So there's legitimacy to the story, right? You couldn't just start, great stories have to be credible. You can't just hope to spin something like that. Right? No, and, you and, have and to listen, address I mean, concerns. Not not in today. Well, I think in generally you just can't spin with uh, attentive consumers. But consumers today, especially the millennials, especially those that demand radical transparency, yes, no, yes. you just can't. And the technology is simply removing all friction and understanding whether a claim is true or not. It's yeah, just too right. easy. So, to so I think out. brands need to work really, really hard. So they got to get the foundations right. And then they also need to figure out how to breakthrough. Yes. Um, I did think some of the brands like Nespresso did a really good job. I mean, obviously, you know, they understood that the tin cups were a potential liability um, from recycling. So really stepped into uh, getting recycling right and kind of building a narrative around that. And even around, um, you know, one of my favorite projects at Nestle, I, I led or co-led Open Innovation. We created a open innovation platform that was kind of anchored to the story of the founder, Henri Nestle, um, we decided to call it, you know, Henry, almost kind of bringing it back to life. But uh, one of our, we would put business briefs out there. And one of them was like, how do we tell a better story around sustainability? And so, you know, got hundreds of briefs. And one of the ones that ultimately made it was uh, a technology enabler that put cameras into the coffee fields where you could go to your app and you could look at the Costa Rican farm, Nicaraguan farm, wherever you wanted to go. And that is, I think, the future. That is where it's going. And yes, I think yes. we're People in People want to a... see where their food comes from, where things are sourced. And so then leveraging the power of story to be able to reveal that and, and put that in the palms of consumers. And you have to make it interesting. You yeah. may have to get into the story of, of the farmer. But what's interesting today is that I think we're in a renaissance of storytelling. I think the new capabilities emerging from voice to augmented reality, virtual reality are infinitely revealing of brand storytelling opportunity. It's really hard to figure out. It's almost like you have to work harder to kind of fill the pipe because the expectations of the technologies are very, very rich. And so I do think, um, and this is more than just data targeting. This is much richer. This is almost like going back to older forms of advertising and kind of putting it on putting it on steroids. I think a lot of what's happening on Netflix and all the content sites are actually kind of good training because we are in a renaissance of of what we used to call TV. It's mm-hmm. it's long form and it's very, very rich. And I think it's going to be translated into augmented reality and it's just a massive opportunity. I do think one area that is a really important area to think about, as we mentioned earlier, is on the sustainability piece. I just think if you're going to Try to become a good storyteller. This is a good pressure test because you've got the skepticism out there, but you've also got an incredible, if you are doing good stuff, this is your moment. And this is the area where you will get richly rewarded in social media amplification, in sales. I mean, think of all the retailers that are putting a big premium on what brands do with sustainability. Um, and it's not just Kroger. I mean, I mean, Walmart was way ahead on this like 15 years ago. They kind of leaned in, but now Kroger is really making some really, really important moves. So there's some, I think, some great opportunity for um, 
brands and retailers will like to uh, open the door in this area? I, you know, it's interesting to see the trends in putting the access of content creation into the hands of consumers, that then creating you know, a sort of a new wave of authenticity and um, everyday life sort and of brilliance. matter. Yes, yeah. And they're really, really good. They're really I mean, good. And there's a lot for brands to learn, and they are learning rapidly, I think, for the most part, uh, about building on that kind of authenticity and not not just in their storytelling but in their practices. And sustainability, I think, is one trend or topic or really Im- important issue that um, that p- creates that kind of opportunity to build authenticity, to reveal more transparently um, what what is being done by the brand, why the consumer should care about that. And consumers do care about that. And so would you speak a little bit to – you walked in – just quickly back to Nestle yeah, because yeah. you walked into such a huge challenge. <laughs> what did you do? How did – was that a scary time? Was there a certain moment where you felt like some of the story started to break through and the new narrative was forming? Like what? What you know, it's frustrating moments? at first because, you know, it's it's hard to tell a story against uh, kind of a, a massive countercurrent of negatives. And so – and this is where, um, you know, I had in my in my book, I called these um, – I'm trying to think of the name that I used to call them. But they're basically, you know, they're, they're, they're these dark spots that are – out there on the internet that just kind of negate what you're trying to say. and The haters. You know, <laughs> not, yeah, not, but, you not, know, I'm speaking in a creator language, but, but yeah. yeah you, well, actual, you got determined detractors yes. that are creating the most um, aggressive content, but a lot of the swing voters, if you will, get access to, to it, again, through just basic search. And so you have to kind of, you know, you have to kind of work in that environment. And then, yeah, and then trying to, get a large organization comfortable with certain types of narratives when they just didn't have a lot of digital experience. And so that gets really difficult. There's the what, what do you say? And then there's the how. And companies, I think, struggle on both sides. Um, I do think to your earlier point, there is, I would draw a lot of inspiration from the long tail of content creators. And I've always been very inspired by how certain influencers talk on Facebook, um, Twitter, and then more recently, um, Instagram and TikTok. I mean, they really understand the principle of bre- brevity is the soul of wit. They speak with authenticity, fantastic visual benefit, you know, visualization. Yeah, very engaging. Um, you know, and it's kind of amazing today with an iPhone camera, you can do, you can create content comparable to what we were spending a hundred thousand dollars on when I started as a PNG brand manager for for advertising, and so. It's opening up all sorts of doors and lessons. I think for brands, they need to be incredibly humble. They need to um, maybe put aside the righteousness of their fact books and just kind of listen and observe the young storytellers that are kind of breaking through. And I know we often have debates over whether engagement matters. Um, I think brands fixate too much on that direct line to purchase, but there's absolutely no question that the communicators that are getting the likes and the shares and the and the pass alongs and the very very deep comments are connecting. I mean, they're and then, and those stories are being enhanced. I mean, that's obviously what's so powerful today is that storytelling isn't A to B; it's a continuous process. In fact, you know, it's like that New York Times article that is ten times better because of the comments. And so, this is an area that I think brands need to really understand. For example, I don't think brands in general, and we worked on this a lot at Nestle, and I'd, you know, even when I left, I still don't think that we got to the right level. But customer service is a storytelling process. Yes, it's a it's yeah. a marketing opportunity. Yeah, you know, and the service industry really understands that. Yeah, the of hotels, course. yeah, yeah um, the experience. Industry. Yeah, it's like yeah. they're almost like they're waiting for the complaint so they can then kind of tell the story of how they're going to uh, enhance your experience, whether it's the bed upgrade or whether it's some other feature that they have. I think traditional brands still struggle with this, but they can learn a lot from the Instagram generation because you look at the early influencers, I mean, you know, they leave no comment behind. Yes, yes, right? yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's, it's all, all part of engagement. their collective story that continues and continues. Yeah, absolutely. I want to get back to sustainability mm-hmm. and some of the challenges of trying to change the narrative, especially from a brand perspective. And when we're working toward a new future 
and our past practices perhaps weren't sustainable and we're having to pivot, we're choosing to pivot rather, and, um, and we're having to storytell in a way that takes us, you know, takes our consumers along that journey with us. That's such a massive challenge. What it's are- a huge challenge. And I think you have to take a step back and really think about what I sometimes call the four stages of sustainability and kind of think about it in a historical context. I mean, initially it started with the fringe. It was kind of led by activists. And then you had this wave of compliance, which was like, what are the rules and the laws? Yes, regulation. Um, yeah. You know, and sometimes companies would respond with ridiculously small print disclosures that nobody could read, mm-hmm. but technically checked off a box with their lawyers. Uh, the third kind of more advance in the risk area, like what's the business exposure from inadequate response? Um, and then the big one that I think really speaks to the opportunity with storytelling, provided there's substance behind it is what's the growth potential given the consumer demand. And so millennials today expect this almost as a price of entry. And, you know, this is, um, and and brands need to really, really think through. So one of the things that we're doing at Centrifuge for some of our clients is, um, you know, I'm, I'm really into gap analysis. And so, and maybe it goes back to my day starting Planet Feedback where we did internet monitoring, but You know, I love to do a gap analysis on things like using Alexa or Google Home. And if you go to, um, you know, Google Assistant and say, hey, Google, is Unilever sustainable? Um, Sometimes the answer will take you to some, you know, very extreme third party. Sometimes it'll give you the wrong response if you say is... Uh, is is Dove beauty products, you know, uh, do they recycle their their tubes or whatever? You know, you might get a random response and really understanding, you know, who's telling the story. In 99% of the cases, it's a third party. Why is that? Because brands don't know how to market to algorithms. Brands don't know how to position their content so they can speak to these emerging voice devices. Now, if you're a typical brand person, you'll say, dude, there's not enough people that are using voice. But if you do a analysis on the numbers, you will say that millennials are three times more likely it's to go to Alexa. <laughs> and they're the ones that are going to say very quickly, without hesitation, without friction, um, what's the what's the story behind this brand? You know, are they ethical? Do they have responsible sourcing practices? So brands, I think, need to understand like where the requests for storytelling is coming from. It's not just clicking on a website. It's just friction-free. You could be in the shower saying, hmm, I wonder if this brand has its act together on yeah, palm oil. Yeah, is, and the, then, is the shampoo I'm using uh, tested on animals? And then, right? and then how, what's the response? Yeah. Who's the spokesperson? Yeah, should yeah. we take trusted, spo- should you take a trusted spokesperson like George Clooney and say, okay, George, as part of your contract, you now have to tell the story through voice. Interesting. You're not seeing that today, but logically that makes yeah. a world of sense. Wouldn't totally you want does, common yeah. equity? Yeah. But who's going to do that? But the good news is that, you know, for agencies, consultants, um, people that are passionate about this, I think this is a golden opportunity to step up to brands and actually show them a new way. And moreover, I'm absolutely convinced, uh, and this is the theme of my talk later on today, I, I've got this term that I call uh, SRI, Sustainability Return on Innovation. And the point is that if you get it right with sustainability, everything else will follow. And the epiphany for me came when I was, I did, I've I've been a juror several times for the Khan Innovation Lions. And last summer, we looked at like 300 absolutely fantastic campaigns. There was zero political agenda. But what happened is that the top awards that we gave, um, four of them had to do with extreme disabilities. Three of them had to do with sustainability, and that was not by design. And I ended up writing an article for AdAge reflecting on this, and my conclusion is that extreme challenges lead to great innovation. And the sustainability areas in particular really, really raise the bar of thinking. You know, it's it's urgent. I mean, even think today, like what you're seeing with um, – on one hand, I don't like to use the example, but I still think it, it, it works is the COVID-19 – there's a lot of innovation underway that's driven by this sense of urgency yeah, absolutely. and all sure. hands on deck. And I think sustainability has a chance to do the exact same thing. Like I believe that brands that really figure out the green narrative 
understand that there's a liability of not having a good story when someone says, hey, Alexa, you know, Mm -hmm. is Tide sustainable, um, that it can raise the bar for everything else. And so, again, like, where do you pick the... I think the good storyteller picks that one area to focus on that has the opportunity to lead all the other areas. Yep. Um, and I think the brands that kind of win on sustainability and meet those very critical torture test needs of millennials are going to hit a home run on everything else. Let me, I think you'll like this story. Yeah. So a couple of years back, Untold Content worked with the Shepherd Chemical Company, which is a mid-sized yeah, love, manufacturer yeah, yeah. Uh, located in just outside of Cincinnati, in Norwood. Yes, exactly. Um, they have about 200 employees, right? And they got nominated for one of their innovations around spray foam, which is sort of like an insulator, mm-hmm. right? But uh, the the chemical industry was having to switch because of a regulation around sustainability, switch away from very toxic chemicals that used to go into spray foam and switch to new ones. And Shepard had invented a, a catalyst that was going to be perfect for essentially making a, it's called a blowing agent, sort of makes the spray foam puff up, I guess you'd say. And so we worked with them to create this story for this innovation award. It was an international innovation award for polyurethanes. And they were up against Dow and Huntsman. And they went to the conference, presented this, you know, the story of that, the sustainability story of it, the way that they responded to this new regulatory change that's coming. And this is an industry audience, right? Full of chemists and polyurethane scientists and uh, and purchasers. Yes. And typically male, typically older or, mm-hmm. or middle-aged. And and they won that award against Dow and Huntsman because love it. it spoke to the human and it spoke to uh, a need to stay on top of and, and be aware of and responsible and accountable to the need to be sustainable, which in the chemical industry in particular, that's a massive challenge. But you see certain companies, um, and, and, and Dow has a lot of really powerful sustainability stories now, um, it, it, that I've seen that that's increased very rapidly lately. But it was really a, a surprise sort of Cinderella story that they would go up against those players and win. Well, I love that story, and it maps to how I often think about Centrifuge. And even though we're funded by a lot of the big companies, and I'm extremely grateful for that, a lot of the best innovation comes from the mid-sized companies. Um, so uh, Shepard Te- Chemical Company or even Michael Men, who we work very closely with. And to some extent, they're kind of small enough to work with startups right, at right, a much right, yeah, faster yeah. rate. They have a lot of experience there. And well, that's not so, the, the gate walls aren't quite so sturdy there uh, of the castle. Yeah. <laughs> and and listen, sense. I mean, there's, there's a little more arguably opportunity more agility. agility yeah, and jinx. I do think, um, <laughs> you know, and there's some fantastic kind of stories that emerge from that. One of the, one of the winners from Khan was, uh, it was called This is a Tree from Philippines. It was Boysen Paint. And here's how it was the technology was amazing. So they had a technology that apparently, um, if you painted a wall in the Philippines, especially in like the really smoggy areas, it created enough um, positive, you know, CO. It, it basically had the equivalent benefit to the environment as planting um, a tree. And so they literally just muraled the entire downtown, you know, city. Um, but it brought this incredible benefit, but it still kind of promoted the product. Yes, and of course yes. the murals were the storytellers. Oh, incredible. And so, so you had this sustainability benefit. You had this excuse to kind of paint stories all over um, an urban district that probably needed some uh, flowery paintings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and we, and, and everyone it was wins. An incredibly creative use of the technology. Yeah, incredible. So what, what other trends, what other, uh, especially, you know what, actually, let me ask you a yeah. more basic question that I haven't gotten, we sure. haven't actually gotten to nail down just yet. From your perspective, what role does storytelling play to innovation? Oh, I think, it, 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 storytelling plays a role with innovation at a number of different levels. I mean, number one, you always have to persuade, um, you know, storytelling persuades your end consumer who buys the product, but it also persuades the manager or the boss or the team that you need to bring into the fold. And so this is one reason why I've been such a, you know, strident believer in kind of 
you know, the, the, the power of, you know, rhetoric, not not as like the BS rhetoric, but right, really right. about how not do telling you stories like lying. how do you bring people <laughs> along um, for entrepreneurship? It's absolutely critical. I mean, when I did a startup, it was all storytelling to get people to leave a fantastic job to to join the crazy guy who had some vision for the future of feedback or to sell investors who when you didn't really have a product or sales, but to kind of bring them into the process um, and so on and so forth, even to bring in your first customers um, to take a chance for a product that might not scale because you might not be in business. And so the story is everything and stories build confidence, uh, stories drive partnership, stories build trust, stories entertain. If you can start with entertainment, you kind of keep the attention longer. And I'm constantly in this new job thinking about like what stories will keep attention longer. So for example, I've tested every conceivable story about Cincinnati and trying okay, to Okay, what out, what do you got? <laughs> well, you know the one that is really clicking um and there's so many fantastic attributes here, but you know my job, I'm trying to get more risk capital here, I'm trying to get more VC money here. I'm trying to get more people here that are kind of doing the same thing, to hold hands together more. Um, and so I'm testing a lot of different messaging. The one that has worked the best externally, I do think what's happened with um, the airport is a really interesting story. And it's a, it's a multifaceted story. It's a story of this little engine then could airport that we kind of wrote off many years ago now does over 80 pilots at a time with startups, which is remarkable. That kind of humbles yes, even amazing. the biggest, any, that humbles companies in the Silicon Valley. It's a story of a female leader named Candace McGraw who kind of defied the rules, bucked the trends, picked up the phone, called up Jeff Bezos and basically brokered a deal to bring um, you know, the world's biggest e-commerce company to the Midwest not just to Cincinnati, but to the Midwest. And what is our story? Our story today is that we are now the number one e-commerce distribution hub in the country. It's not just Amazon, it's DHL. And that is a powerful story. And when I tell that story to people on the outside, they stop, they look at me, and they ask for more. And again, going back to Aristotle, how do you command the audience so they ask for more? Yes. And I think that story is going to keep that story is going to be a gift that keeps on giving, but it's up to us to pour value into the story. So for example, what does it mean when Amazon is right here in Cincinnati? I believe we're going to have a renaissance of DTC entrepreneurs that come to Cincinnati that normally wouldn't be here because they see massive efficiencies of being closer to the plains. Yep. It's simple economics. Yep. yep. They're also going to look around and realize, oh, this town is way cooler than I thought. Right. Exactly. Just like I did. Yes. Yes. Elitist yeah. Californian <laughs> Comes to Cincinnati via Switzerland. Switzerland. <laughs> Wife was in New York. We're like, what are we here? Why are we here? We look around. We're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. The story of the heritage, the story of the beer caves, you know, the story. <laughs> and now we've got, yeah. you know, and to some extent, where did the story begin with the Midwest? We were this great cor trade corridor, the city on the river that really was a massive economic engine and and now it's reinventing itself. And I think we all need to raise the bar in retelling the story. And it's not just a centrifuge story or a Cincy Tech story or Chamber of Commerce story. Everyone in this town needs to kind of romance that story because we all know people that are on the outside. We all know boomerang prospects. We all know someone in the venture capital world that has an elitist view towards the Midwest. And we need to, we don't need to brag because humility is our strength and it is the opening that makes us great storytellers. But we also need to make sure that that story breaks through. And like someone who's am marketing on Amazon, we need to test a lot of messages. But I think that one is a very powerful one. It's also a story that unites the two states. Yes, it gets yes, us out of yes, that parochial yeah, of yeah. Southern Ohio versus forget that. We yeah. are now the great supply way. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the terms I've, I kind of came up with. I'm waiting for someone to say, I don't like that term, but we're now the great supply way. <laughs> okay. You know, right. for I'll start trying that. the Midwest. And I think there's going to be massive potential that emerges from that. So, how'd I do? Is there a story brewing there? Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so pattern, pattern across all of those. Uh, 
all of those stories, if, if we had to like identify a story pattern for our city for right now anyway, it's sort of the surprise reveal, the underdog, right? Like that we're, It's the we're, understated overachiever. Yes, I love it. Because you're never going to get rid of the yes. humility. Yes. It drives right. me crazy sometimes because I'm like, hey, we're not getting credit for this. But that is our identity. And yeah. so let's figure out how to turn that into an opportunity. I actually think a lack of flash helps. I think we're all getting pretty sick and tired of the excess, you know, the massive, you know, uh, income gaps in California, my former state and, you know, the flashy tech. And so I think there's a way we can do it in a way that is is credible. It's sustainable. um, It's inclusive. I think our story, the story of inclusive entrepreneurialism is something that I believe we're not there yet, but there is an unmistakable will to figure that out. And I think the nice thing about digital and tech, it allows you to kind of start with a clean sheet of paper and say, what will it take? And we know there's a lot of regions that are getting that right. You know, Detroit's making progress, Atlanta's making progress. And this is where I think, but we need to kind of plant a flag and say, um, and I do think, you know, declaring intent is really important. It's a very important part of the storytelling. What I've tried to do since I arrived is to really put some focus on the areas where we can tell a story. And some of that links to incumbent strengths like, hey, um, future branding and retail, um, connected health, Definitely. fin and insure tech, supply chain and logistics. Um, and then underneath that, kind of cutting across all of those is sustainability and also operating philosophies like inclusive entrepreneurialism, but really being very clear on why, you know, we have strengths. And if you look at other regions that are getting a lot of investment capital, bringing in more boomerangs, I mean, look at Pittsburgh, for example, they have really built a compelling narrative around artificial intelligence, robotics, um, Carnegie Mellon. They're getting a ton of jobs from Google. But they've kind of, it's a real story, but they've also romanced it. Detroit is really putting a broadly defined narrative around mobility, Memphis and Nashville around health tech. Austin's got a couple, but, and it doesn't need to be perfect. Right, right. You know, I I, I have sometimes tell people, I don't care whether you call it digital health, connected health, human health, just pick one (laughs) and tell the story. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so people know yeah. it's like it's like it's like I say like, could it yeah we can't if you don't like grit supply way pick another story but let's align and let's On tell the world that's are. that's great marketing yes well and I think it's so critical as as venture capital moves out of just New York and California right and it starts to infiltrate the rest of the United States and we see that happening. I am so grateful to live in a city that prioritizes innovation, um, that that appoints leaders like yourself to continue to spark it and find those trends and help tell our story and and pull in those collaborations. I don't think we want to um, take away from what's happening in Silicon Valley or in New York. It's just that we're ready to play and we have a, we have a seat at the table and it's it's an important one at this point. We know who we are. We know our voice. We know our essence, and we know how to tell it. Yep. Yep. And we'll work with community to make it happen. Pete, thank you. This thank was you. such an awesome conversation. And it's great that you uh, are in Union Hall. It's uh, great to have you as a partner and uh, best of luck with your podcast. Thank you so much. I, I know the listeners will get so much uh, energy out of this conversation. So thanks. <laughs> you bet. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. Untold Content.